Ushijima had had about 90,000, not counting the Okinawan Home Guard. Although saving their honour by fighting to the end couldn't possibly have achieved anything more than inflicting damage before they died, that damage would have been terrible. Thousands of planes were intact, the tallies vary from 3 to 16,000, many of which were carefully hidden and designated for kamikaze use. Some 5,000 additional pilots were being trained to fly them. Had they been sent up, with their shorter distances to cover, the toll inflicted would have been stunning and supplemented by a panoply of old and new kamikaze weapons. The radio commentator who said he looked forward to an early landing just to sense the thrill when we strike a deadly blow to the enemy and promised worldwide amazement at Japan's array of special attack weapons wasn't entirely bluffing about the latter. Allied naval brass, knowing the Japanese had been concentrating on the mainland's defence for months, braced for much more intense kamikaze attacks than those at Okinawa. Unlike the earlier concentration on warships, the chief targets this time, in an effort to shatter the invaders' morale with the maximum possible casualties, would have been the troops wading in to land. However, the greatest toll would have been farther inland, where the incomparable Japanese infantry, as an American analyst later assessed it, would have been supported by vastly more artillery than on Okinawa. American anticipation of the cost was evident in the 42 divisions allotted to the invasion. Seven had fought on Okinawa. The often cited total of a million American casualties is fanciful. That figure appears to have made its public debut 18 months after the fact, in a magazine article by Secretary of War Henry Stimson, although other writers would claim the source was General MacArthur, whose casualty estimates in previous battles had been uncannily accurate. MacArthur did make a careful study of the mainland operation at President Truman's request, but his prediction was much lower. Although several other agencies conducted studies then and later, no one can say how good their estimates were, because it was impossible to know how much more fighting would be necessary to overrun the entire mainland or compel a surrender. Those were the crucial questions on which Japanese attitudes at Okinawa surely bear. The entire population of Japan is a proper military target. There are no civilians in Japan according to 5th Air Force Intelligence Report, July 21, 1945. Austin Aria, American infantryman, said, How the hell are you going to storm a country where women and children, everybody would be fighting you? Of course we'd have won eventually. But I don't think anybody who hasn't actually seen the Japanese fight can have any idea of what it would have cost. The predictability of the veterans' renewed love for the bomb when they saw what it saved them from is no reason to dismiss arguments for its use. Of course it killed many people, but the equation, if there is one, must include those it saved, to the extent that saving now seems established and the number can be estimated. Although the American fighting men who cheered little boy and fat man for bestowing them with survival cared virtually nothing about the Japanese losses, they, the enemy deaths, must of course be taken into consideration, but not simply the gruesome ones at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The ratio of Japanese combat deaths to American was over 10 to 1 on Okinawa. It might have been marginally lower if fighting had proceeded to the enemy's heartland, where reinforcements would have been more easily available than to the Japanese garrisons on the cut-off islands. However, civilian deaths from conventional combat surely would have been much higher, if only because the mainland had many more civilians who were committed to die for emperor and country. The best estimates of total Japanese deaths in a conventional mainland campaign are 5 to 10 million. If civilian kamikaze and life-threatening resistance had generated hysteria, a likely prospect in light of the experience on Guam and Okinawa, the toll might have been higher. The country would have been levelled and burned to cinders. New information confirms that Stalin was preparing to land troops on the northernmost home island of Hokkaido, home to many of Captain Kojo's soldiers. If the Red Army had seized it, Japanese casualties, extrapolating from the number of prisoners of war who died in Soviet camps, would have reached 400,000. That would have been just a part of the loss if, as a full Allied partner during ground combat from 1945 to 1946 or later, Stalin insisted on dividing Japan like Korea and Germany. All post-war life, starting with retarded economic recovery, would have suffered heavily.
Any estimate of the savings gained by the atomic bombs must also include hundreds of thousands of combatants and civilians in China, Manchuria and other territories still occupied, often viciously, by Japan. The Pacific War had already claimed at least 16 million lives, 3 million of which were Japanese. The American figure in both the Atlantic and Pacific theatres was roughly 290,000. In China alone, only three more months of it would probably have cost 100,000 more. In addition, tens of thousands of British soldiers would have been killed and wounded among the 200,000 scheduled to invade the Malay Peninsula on September 9, a month after Nagasaki. Six divisions, the same number as at Normandy, had been assigned to that operation, which was expected to take seven months of savage fighting, over half the time required to defeat Hitler's armies in Europe. The savings must also include European and Eurasian prisoners of the Japanese, chiefly from English and Dutch colonial military and civil forces. After the fall of Okinawa, Field Marshal Hisaichi Tarauchi directed his prison camp commanders to kill all their captives the moment the enemy invaded his Southeast Asia theatre, which would have been in September when those 200,000 British landed to retake Singapore. There was a real chance that some or many of Count Tarauchi's subordinates would have carried out his order, in which case up to another 400,000 people would have been massacred. Even more were doomed to soon die of natural causes. Japanese treatment of their prisoners grew more brutal as the military situation worsened and their hatred swelled. Dying daily in droves throughout the summer of 1945, even more would have perished of disease and starvation during the following winter. Lawrence van der Post, who'd been a prisoner for more than 40 months, was convinced the majority of the half-million captives in the hellish camps couldn't possibly have survived the year 1946. Those numbers might justify Churchill's use of deliverance for the atomic bombs, even knowing the cost was the hundred thousand or more horrible deaths of men, women and children. The natural wish to dismiss that price as too dreadful can be satisfied only by denying the more dreadful military and political realities of 1945. On the other hand, the figures are an eternal indictment if an invasion was unnecessary. Once again, that is the real question. Did even those hundred thousand have to die at Hiroshima and Nagasaki? Wasn't Japan already beaten? James Jones' book WW2 mentions Japan was finished as a war-making nation, but Japan's leaders were going to fight right on. To not lose face was more important than hundreds and hundreds of thousands of lives. To continue was no longer a question of Japanese military thinking. It was an aspect of Japanese culture and psychology. Thomas R. H. Havens, Valley of Darkness, The Japanese People and World War II mentions The cabinet expected the volunteers to be home-front equivalents of the kamikaze pilots, who went into battle with meagre weapons fully prepared to die. Civilians may have been fed up, and the volunteers may have felt foolish training with spears and awls, but nearly everyone on the home front kept up the fight to the very end. The country's woeful condition before the bombs were dropped was hardly secret either. Virtually her entire merchant marine and navy lay at the bottom of the Pacific, while America alone, without the Royal Navy, had 23 battleships, 99 carriers and 72 cruisers on hand in August. The Imperial Navy's corresponding numbers were 1, 6 and 4, and it had fuel enough only to sustain a force of 20 operational destroyers and perhaps 40 submarines, supported by boats and other small craft, for a few days at sea. Nor was sufficient food available for civilians who showed their ration cards in the shops that still stood. Relentless saturation bombing, easier than ever with the new bases on Okinawa and the feeble opposition from Japanese interceptors, was levelling Japan's cities. The average adult existed on under 1,300 calories a day. As many as 13 million were homeless. Malaria and tuberculosis were rampant, especially in the shanty towns rising in the urban ashes. Schoolchildren, barefoot in winter as well as summer, rooted out forest pine stumps for the war effort. The trees themselves were long gone. In Tokushima, home city of many of the 6,000 troops lost on Toyamamaru, metal was so scarce that the bells of shrines were melted down, together with charcoal braziers, the sole source of heat for the remaining wooden paper homes.
While huge numbers of Red Army troops mobilised to attack Manchuria, just as Tadashi Kojo had feared a year earlier, when his regiment was shipped from there to Okinawa, there was no hope of supplying the defenders, even if the merchant fleet hadn't been destroyed and the country's industry wasn't in shambles. Exhausted, slowly starving Japan was in no shape for further fighting. Many in high positions knew that, of course. The cabinet of Hideki Tojo had resigned on the day the fall of Saipan was made public, eight and a half months before Okinawa's L Day. Everyone who knew the elliptical statements of Japanese politics understood that such a change of government after a military blow of that force was an admission of defeat and of desire to end the debacle. Tojo's successor, Kuniaki Koiso, wanted a truce and tried to obtain it, partly with a flimsy attempt to negotiate with Washington and London through Chiang Kai-shek. His replacement, an elderly baron named Kantaro Suzuki, tried harder. The partially peace-seeking cabinet of the third wartime prime minister was installed the day after Yamato's sinking. Suzuki's necessary noises would soon include the proposition that Okinawa's loss had improved Japan's strategic position while dealing a crushing spiritual blow to America. Now is the time for every one of the hundred million to become glorious shields for the defence of the national structure. But the clearest signal of his real intentions was the appointment of career diplomat Shigenori Togo as foreign minister. Disgusted by the Pearl Harbour trickery, Togo went on to become one of Japan's most forceful critics of the war and the military establishment. Until recently, the emperor, a little like Tsar Nicholas II during World War I, had been more concerned with preserving his imperial prerogatives than with ameliorating the suffering of his people. Like his army leadership, he firmly believed that the decisive battle would take place in the homeland and did nothing to encourage responses to American peace feelers in May while the Shuri line held. No response was made, but by the summer his earlier satisfaction in the expanding empire was gone. As he'd reveal soon after the war, the smashing of the 32nd Army convinced him that Okinawa must be the final battle. There was now no choice but unconditional surrender. On June 22, 1945, the day before the southern flag raising, he summoned the Supreme War Council to the Imperial Palace. Expressing deep concern about the state of the war, he apparently suggested that diplomatic feelers should be made to try to end it. In other words, he'd become a supporter of the peace faction, inasmuch as the scattered individuals it comprised deserved to be called a faction, and his guarded hints could be construed as substantive support. Now the government renewed earlier efforts to persuade Moscow to use its good offices for negotiations with the Allies. Since Stalin was already moving huge forces from Germany to join the struggle against Japan, however, those efforts had not the slightest chance for success. Still, the unknowing Japanese peace advocates pursued Moscow more and more urgently, while Hirohito sought to encourage talk of peace in confidential meetings with former prime ministers. The Yushin, as that small group was called, were in tacit alliance with other elder statesmen. Even a few military leaders such as Admiral Mitsumasa Yonai, the Minister of the Navy, who hadn't opposed Yamato's sortie as vigorously as he'd wanted to, because he was already preoccupied by the larger question of how to stop the war. The sprinkling of peace advocates included Marquis Koichi Kido, the Lord Privy Seal, and Hirohito's closest political adviser. Among their other efforts were three probes in Sweden and Switzerland. While those were being pursued, cabinet members marshalled evidence that continued fighting was impossible, and the Emperor's confidential advisers urged more directly, and to ever more receptive ears, that the war was lost and must be stopped. The forbidden word peace was even pronounced in restricted public. How, then, can the slaughter of Hiroshima's and Nagasaki's civilians possibly be justified? Didn't American policymakers know that Japanese slogans in the summer of 1945, the sooner they, the Americans, come, the better? One hundred million die proudly, were ritual bleats by the vanquished and humiliated. August 11, diary entry of Admiral Matome Ugaki commander of the 5th Air Fleet on Kyushu, which carried out kamikaze and conventional attacks on the American fleet off Okinawa, mentions something fascinating. The atomic bomb attacks and the Soviet entry into the war, thus deteriorating our position, shocked us. But we can take some countermeasures, 
we still have enough fighting strength remaining. Furthermore, don't we have large army forces still intact on the Chinese continent and in our homeland? It might be the view of some clever fellows to surrender with some strength left instead of being completely destroyed. But those fellows advocating that idea are nothing but selfish weaklings who don't think seriously about the future of the nation and only seek immediate benefits. Ugaki on the possibility that Japan might surrender after the destruction of Hiroshima and Nagasaki said, This is a great problem for me. Although an emperor's order must be followed, I can hardly bear to see us suspend attacks while we still have this fighting strength. I think many things remain to be done after consulting with those brave men willing to die. The atomic killing can be justified only if the growing opposition to the war by the imperial household and elements of the government and the military were irrelevant because they were totally doomed to fail. And the evidence, although it can never by the nature of things be wholly convincing, points in that direction. For example, the Japanese ambassador in Moscow believed the peace overtures to Stalin were ridiculous because they claimed too much for Japan. At that point, even the emperor preferred waiting for a more favourable moment to offer serious concessions, meanwhile keeping up the fight to show the Americans the disadvantages of continuing the war. More to the point, the government wouldn't accept Washington's demand for unconditional surrender because the military still controlled it. How solidly! Those who wanted to end the war were frightened, no matter how high their positions. Prime Minister Koiso had undertaken his peace initiatives in great secrecy, probably in fear for his life. Even Prime Minister Kantaro Suzuki, an admiral and hero of the Russo-Japanese War of 1905 as well as a baron, could not make direct approaches for negotiation without courting another attempt on his life. The first had been in 1936. The 78-year-old Grand Chamberlain was weakened by a bullet still lodged in his heart from the time of the extreme ultra-nationalist's most ambitious coup attempt. Besides, all the would-be peacemakers were on the periphery of real state power. Japan remained dominated by the Supreme War Council's die-hard faction, the very kind of Manchuria gang activists and sympathisers who had terrorised and assassinated opponents in the 1920s and 1930s and helped push the country into her wars. Even the civilian leaders who'd begun whispering the hitherto blasphemous thought that the fighting had to stop had scant hope it would. The Lord Privy Seal put it in a nutshell in early June, when the 32nd Army was facing its annihilation on Okinawa. In a secret memorandum to the throne, Marquis Kido ventured that Japan had lost the war, regrettable though it is. Nevertheless, the overriding determinant was the military leader's will to fight to the death. Therefore, he had to advise the emperor that any peace move was almost impossible. The public record is long and full on the real ruler's refusal to consider negotiation until after a decisive tenozen on the mainland. So far, the old guard insisted, the war had been a series of indecisive skirmishes. Now was the time to lure the Americans to their annihilation in the final battle on Japanese soil required for preservation of the national honour. Some 150,000 dead Okinawans were proof of their determination to continue sacrificing any number of civilians to that resolution. Even if the Japanese people are weary of the war, commander of the combined fleet, Admiral Suemu Toyoda, insisted, we must fight to the last man. And scarcely any of those last men themselves, the cannon fodder, made the slightest sign of opposition, let alone protest, no more than did Captain Kojo's doomed men. Most Japanese, including civilians, still couldn't conceive of any other end to the war than victory or death. Just before the Emperor's August 14 broadcast telling his people to accept defeat, Tokyo shopkeepers sharpened knives, expecting an order for the entire nation to commit kamikaze. But the decisions lay with the military diehards, and fighting to the death was indeed what they were utterly resolved to do. To men such as Toyoda and War Minister General Korechika Anami, death for honour and Japan was more than ever life's purpose. That same August, Captain Kojo, who'd known for months of his emperor's order to capitulate, didn't do so, even though he had no men to command and no military function whatever. No thought of surrender ever entered the conscious thoughts of the desperate straggler on Okinawa, because he yearned for his war to end in his death,
Just as thousands of otherwise admirable kamikaze pilots had sought personal rewards, not military advantage, from their gestures. Although the political generals in Tokyo could not have entirely avoided mention of surrender, it represented to them the worst conceivable eventuality, incomparably worse than expiration. Little of the military affirmation was bombast. None of it changed until the atomic bombs, both of them. Even then, some of the key generals insisted the fighting should continue in the ashes, and the resolution of even the less fiercely committed decision-makers ebbed so slowly, with such distant prospect of the eventual acceptance of common sense over Bushido, the way of the warrior, that continued resistance was all but inevitable. Their relegation of other considerations, such as the desire to continue living, to secondary importance, much diminishes the significance of the evidence of Japan's weakened condition and the small but waxing peace faction. That situation wouldn't have gone on forever, but surely for the remainder of 1945, to make an optimistic estimate. Since the commanders of the army and the nation were almost certain to prevail, if necessary by assassinating any weaklings who dared speak openly about ending the war, the documentation of the country's wretched condition after the defeat on Okinawa is indeed largely irrelevant. It demonstrates that further fighting was senseless in Western perception, but not that of the ruling Japanese. The handful of leaders who wanted to negotiate peace had an extremely slim chance of performing the unprecedented feat of convincing the Imperial Army diehards to abandon the powerful code and passionate ethic under which they had striven until now. That they'd have had utterly no hope of victory in the decisive battle wasn't the point for the Manchuria gang, even less than it had been for the admirals who had sacrificed Yamato in their war for honour. Many areas of the mainland much resembled Okinawa in terrain. Kyushu in particular was even more riddled with caves. As for supplies, Japan's armoury had enough for more years of detrimental delaying actions on this mountain and at that escarpment. Superior American firepower would have provoked more murderous savagery on both sides and deeper cultural devastation of Japan. Calls would have been made for ever greater sacrifice, although they already specified that every life must be given for the country. That's why many Japanese civilians as well as American infantrymen cheered the bomb. Not surprisingly, the Japanese kept their approval to themselves. Even half a century later, few feel able to voice their belief that the terrible weapon liberated them. But non-militarist Japanese, of whom there were surely millions, now and then do whisper a confession that they believed they were doomed before Hiroshima and Nagasaki saved them. Conservatively put, Okinawa demonstrated the extreme unlikelihood of surrender by the Japanese who held the country in their grip, no matter what the odds against successful defence. The foregone outcome of the battle for the island neither made the Japanese fight less resolutely nor diminished the casualties on either side, or among Okinawan civilians. And the capitulation that was inconceivable to the Mitsuru Ushijimas and Tadashi Kojos was equally so to those military leaders in Tokyo, whose education and attitudes were identical. As we're about to see, the high commanders were extremely reluctant, and in some cases simply unwilling to consider surrender, even after Hiroshima and Nagasaki. A stronger case can be made against the second bomb, especially its dropping so cruelly soon after the first. The Supreme War Council's minutes reveal that Hiroshima's destruction made no real dent in its thinking. After acknowledging that an awesome new weapon had caused it, the members essentially proceeded directly to their outstanding military concerns. Nevertheless, three days gave them too little time to assess the damage and the nature of the weapon that produced it, let alone to reflect on the larger consequences. Besides, the American decision to destroy Nagasaki on August 9 was made for all the wrong reasons, worries about logistics, weather and other relatively trivial matters rather than about a massive number of human lives or other civilised concerns. And this was only the last of the callous and stupid considerations that influenced American judgment about the momentous issue. The ancient Japanese capital of Kyoto had been removed from the target list at a late moment only because Secretary of War Stimson happened to know its enormous cultural significance. Before that, petty and even selfish motives played their customary parts in the drama. The army generals who supervised the atomic project 
pushed for employing its yield partly to advance their own reputations and to fulfil an obligation to thrift. Not to use a product whose development had cost so much time and money would have been a waste. Whereas the waste some foreign policy directors wanted to avoid was, as mentioned, of the opportunity to unnerve Stalin, who was turning the countries liberated by the Red Army into Soviet satellites. But although it can never be known whether the Japanese in control would have abandoned their commitment if given just a week or two more to consider Hiroshima's significance, the indecent haste with which Nagasaki was demolished so soon on its heels apparently made little difference to them. The Supreme War Council's minutes also reveal that the generals were nearly as determined to continue after the second bomb as after the first. The destruction of the cities appeared to have troubled them less than it did Truman. They were stopped only by the Emperor's unprecedented cabinet pronouncement, after decades of outward silence about decisions made in his name. Even after His Majesty expressed his wish to prevent further slaughter by bearing the unbearable of surrender, it was touch and go during the five days after Nagasaki whether hardliners would prevent him from making his very first broadcast to the nation, the Surrender Resolution, as some were utterly determined to do. A good number of those resolved to continue the war, planned assassinations and a coup, their trusted methods for furthering the emperor's purported real wishes and the country's fundamental values. High officers did commit murders and mutinies, although not enough to prevail. Those circumstances also weakened the argument that a demonstration bomb dropped off a Japanese coast before resort to the deadly ones might have been enough to achieve surrender. From the perspective of the 21st century, conscience probably did require such a warning, even though only two atomic bombs had been made, and the military diehard's grip might have been further strengthened by a demonstration bomb that failed to explode. None of the makers was certain the triggers would work over a target, as opposed to at the test site. Still, the same evidence of the persistence even after Hiroshima and Nagasaki suggests it would have changed none of the relevant minds. No shining wisdom lit a road through the thicket for Truman and his advisers. Some of their ignorance was excusable, because no one knew or could know much about the never-used atomic creation. Many facts that became known after it was unleashed weren't known before, the military chiefs, for example, were convinced an invasion would be necessary even after the bombs were dropped, and they continued planning for it while the arrangements for the bombings went ahead. Nor could they know much about the effects of radiation, since the scientists were uncertain about it. A few predicted disaster, and a sprinkling warned that a catastrophic chain reaction might endanger the entire world, but the great majority disagreed. Nevertheless, the American leaders were characteristically uninterested in the non-military aspects of the new munitions, to which they devoted scant consideration or discussion. Nor was any serious proposal not to use the bomb made or entertained. Time has shed new light on those lapses. During the half-century following the advent of the new bomb, it took on much symbolic weight that wasn't felt at the time, when it was perceived essentially as merely a much more powerful weapon. Knowing what was then known under the then enormous pressures to end the awful war, as opposed to enjoying the luxury of retrospective judgment, only some higher order of human being would have made different decisions, or agonised about them much more than Truman did. And even now, very few commanders-in-chief are much concerned about limiting casualties apart from their own. Still, the President and his advisers knew far too little about Japanese history and culture, just as they did about, one might add, non-white male Americans, such as women, blacks and Native Americans. They cared far too little for the Japanese people. It was almost cynical to have expected Hiroshima residents to take action on the leaflets warning them of impending destruction. Consciously or otherwise, they, like the country as a whole, were steeped in racism. Their concern barely extended beyond winning the war and saving American lives. However, that too misses the point, since the question, once again, is not about them or why they chose to do what they did, but the consequences. Their failures, the selfishness, narrow nationalism, unwillingness to grapple with the full significance of their decisions, didn't change the situation in Japan. Even if the feeble peace faction did manage to turn tables on the militarists, the improbable relief would have come only months or years into the invasion of the mainland when millions of lives would have been lost.
Yes, more willingness to negotiate and a better grasp of the enemy's sensibilities might have coaxed an earlier surrender, but that can be said of any war. And no enemy coaxing had less chance of success than with the commanding members of the Supreme War Council. If Ushijima's laughter at Buckner's surrender proposal was apocryphal, his rejection was no less absolute for that. George C. Marshall, American Chief of Staff, said I was aware of the peace offerings Japan was making to the Russians in the summer of 1945. But the Japanese Prime Minister was unable to control the army. The army was dominant in these matters, and they could only apparently be slugged into submission. George Elsie, Naval Intelligence, decades later said, Truman made no decision because there was no decision to be made. He could no more have stopped it than a train moving down the track. It's all well and good to come along later and say the bomb was a horrible thing. The whole goddamn war was a horrible thing. Not everyone who knew how the Japanese fought approved the use of the bomb. Admirals Ernest King and William Leahy argued that a more hermetic maritime blockade than the one in place during the summer of 1945, coupled with more intense bombing and naval gunfire, would have forced surrender within a reasonable time. Leahy called the atomic bomb an inhuman weapon to use on a people that was already defeated and ready to surrender. We Americans had adopted an ethical standard common to the barbarians of the Dark Ages. A scattering of high-ranking officers, none from infantry units, agreed. A few maintained there was no need for atomic bombs or an invasion. Deprived of supplies and food, Japan would have surrendered sooner or later. Most of that sprinkling spoke out only after the war when evidence became available of just how severely American submarines had crippled Japanese industry. They apparently didn't notice that their argument also applied to the Palau Islands, the Philippines, Iwo Jima, and the other murderous stepping stones. If blockades could have done the job, weren't the deaths there and at Okinawa also logically unnecessary? Either way, their voices were rare exceptions among the fighting men, Otherwise, an almost visible line separated those who judged Japanese intentions through the prism of combat experience from people further removed, military as well as civilian. Complaints about the atomic bomb's inhumanity in particular increased in proportion to their maker's distance from the hell to which the weapon had put an end. In general, Paul Fussell summarised, the principle is, the farther from the scene of horror, the easier the talk. To report that the less one knew about the island battles, the more likely one's disapproval is not to say combat participation was essential for reaching solid conclusions about the bomb, only that the very persuasive arguments against usually leave unmentioned the mortal costs of the alternatives, ignorance of which was likely to strengthen moral opposition. In any case, most of those with actual experience of Japanese behaviour during the war, as opposed to those who reckoned what it ought to have been, were certain blockade and bombing couldn't work. Actually, they might have. The Stars and Stripes and British Ensign flew from nearly a thousand destroyers and destroyer escorts in August, and American yards were launching more every week. Stationed within sight of each other, they and the capital warships, supplemented by thousands of planes, could have sealed off the home islands. But it's hard to understand how that would have saved more lives or otherwise been more humane. On the contrary, it's almost certain the majority of Japanese would have voluntarily or compulsorily, in either case agonisingly, persisted in rejecting surrender even after mass starvation. As Richard Frank concluded in his admirably restrained downfall, The End of the Imperial Japanese Empire, a 1999 study based on archival research that makes many of the old arguments sound like uninformed ranting, alternatives to the atomic bombs carried no guarantee that they would end the war or reduce the amount of human death and suffering. In particular, a blockade, which also wouldn't have distinguished between military personnel and civilians, would probably have been more barbarous because it would have taken more lives, probably many more, by pervasive famine spread by the destruction of the transportation system. It's even harder to imagine that conventional air attacks would have been halted during the process. Wars don't work that way, which may be partly why not even the blockade's handful of advocates suggested the bombing be suspended. Civilian casualties in the 80-odd Japanese cities firebombed by early August were already three to four times larger than those at Hiroshima and Nagasaki combined. On August 1, to take just one example, 
The secondary target of Toyama, a city of 130,000, was 99% burned to ashes, as one report specified. Saturation raids were reaching down to cities of 55,000 inhabitants, because too little was left of Tokyo, Nagoya, Kobe, Osaka, Yokohama, Kawasaki, and other industrial centres to make additional mass attacks on them worthwhile. A key aide to General MacArthur would call those conventional raids one of the most ruthless and barbaric killings of non-combatants in all history. Radio Tokyo's term was slaughter bombing. Critics of using the atomic bombs would stand on firmer moral ground if they also protested the incineration of those cities. Their horror at the barbarity of little boy and fat man would hit harder if it included the killing of so many more hundreds of thousands of civilians by conventional weapons, and acknowledgement that it was certain to continue under the command of the passionately committed Curtis LeMay, the Air Force general who'd promised to beat Japan back to the Dark Ages. On the eve of the March firebombing of Tokyo that killed nearly 200,000, the general wired a colleague to be ready for an outstanding show. If every human life is equally sacred, how can the war's prolongation by more than a month be thought to have been better than a resort to nuclear destruction? And even if LeMay could have been restrained, starvation, exhaustion and disease would have taken many times the toll of the two atomic bombs. That pertains to Japanese lives only. During the months or years of blockade and bombing, hundreds of thousands or millions of non-Japanese would have died, chiefly on the Asian continent, including those allied prisoners of war whose numbers alone would surely have exceeded those of the atomic victims. The Supreme War Council, up to the time the atomic bomb was dropped, did not believe Japan could be beaten by air attack alone. It had proceeded with the one plan of fighting a decisive battle at the landing point, and was making every possible preparation to meet such a landing until the atomic bomb was dropped, at which point they decided it would be best to sue for peace. This was said by Prime Minister Kantaro Suzuki, December 1945. James Jones said, If the defence of the Japanese home islands, with their immensely greater area and enormously greater population, was going to take on the character of the defence of Okinawa, where and when and at what cost was it going to end? Of course, Japan did capitulate, prima facie evidence that all the predictions about her refusal to do so was so much talk. On the other hand, how it was achieved strongly suggests that only the atomic bombs could have done it without the years of decisive battle or mass starvation, for surrender was barely accepted only when the emperor spoke up, and that moment came only five days after Nagasaki. It was the terrifying atomic devastation that prompted his startling intervention, then tipped the balance among military commanders in favour of obeying him. Concluding an imposing study of the Pacific War, the historian Ronald Spector pronounced himself unable to demonstrate how the Japanese high command might have been induced to surrender without the combined shock of the bombs and the Soviet entry into the war on August 8. But while the Red Army's massive power was indeed an added factor, all available records of the thinking of the military leaders and of the emperor suggest it was no more than that. The latter's imperial rescript, the unprecedented broadcast that summoned the nation to surrender made no mention of expected Soviet offensives in Manchuria, perhaps because the army had already written them off, but spoke only of the crucial determinant, the new and most cruel bomb, the power of which to do damage is indeed incalculable. Incalculable went well beyond the emperor's toll of many innocent lives. The apparition of this almost supernatural weapon, said Churchill, gave the courageous Japanese people an excuse to save their honour and release them from their obligation of being killed to the last fighting man. He omitted non-fighting men, women and children. Perhaps some other shock might have accomplished the same, but in the end it was the bombs that provided the face-saving opportunity. The spectacle of the immense American fleet at Okinawa, among the most graphic displays of conventional weaponry in history, had done nothing to reduce General Ushijima's 32nd Army's obligations to code and country. The troops loathed the American planes that pulverised them with virtual impunity from return fire, but fought on defiantly without thought of surrender. They took unimaginable punishment from every available weapon without cracking until the pitiful 5% of survivors had been deprived of supplies, fortifications and leadership.
Brother soldiers would surely be even braver and tougher on the sacred home islands with their immeasurably better preparation. No accumulation of bombs, shells and bullets was likely to free them from their commitment. The chief of the Imperial General Headquarters Operations Section recorded that the geographical advantages of the homeland were to be utilised to the highest degree in that first and only battle in which the main strength of the air, land and sea forces were to be joined. Even if that too was empty bragging, the mainland fighting would surely have been more ferocious than Okinawa's, more like the even harder struggle far harder if the 32nd Army hadn't lost its best unit, the crack 9th Division. Or it would have been worse yet, for the Japanese had guessed the American landing sites with terrible precision, and the invasion force wouldn't have had a two-to-one advantage in numbers, as at Okinawa. On the mainland, the opposing sides would have been roughly equal in size. An analyst of Olympic miscalculations would conclude that it would have been a nightmare for both sides, because far more Americans would have landed on Kyushu than the Japanese expected, and many more Japanese would have been waiting on the beaches, primed to counterattack with everything they had than the Americans anticipated. It turned out that American intelligence, even with its code-breaking advantages, grossly underestimated the Japanese strength throughout the mainland. There was nothing new in that. The army was still expanding. Deployments discovered later were dismaying. As on Okinawa, the defenders managed to muster more and better equipped forces into critical strongholds than the Americans believed. Again, however, the crucial factor was resolution, not numbers. The Japanese leaders, especially War Minister Anami, had no incentive to surrender because they were fighting their different war for face and honour, not victory. They were also confident of inflicting enough damage to break the enemy's morale, evidence of which they saw in every American attempt to propose surrender terms. So the military casualties alone, even if exaggerated by some post-war estimates, would have been immense. If the Battle of Okinawa dwarfed the Battle of Britain, the ultimate Tennyson would have been the most ambitious project in peace or war ever undertaken by the United States, involving thousands of ships, tens of thousands of planes, and more than five million men. History's greatest combat sausage machine might have ground up more American bodies than the entire war until then, in both the Atlantic and Pacific theatres. Everything rested with the six members of the Supreme War Council, most of whom essentially didn't care about the odds against them. They were psychologically blocked, capable only of stumbling forward, the distinguished historian John Dower concluded. Something was needed to free them from their trance. Hardship alone, no matter how severe, wasn't enough. The something had to be qualitatively different from the current mix of conventional arms and strategic pressures, and perhaps it wasn't accidental that the people whose emperor was descended from the sun goddess and whose word for their nation, Japanese, is written with characters that mean origin of the sun, saw the atomic blasts as brighter than a thousand suns. They signalled more than a new weapon. Their explosions represented more than the equivalent of 10,000 tonnes of trinitrotoluene. They announced the appearance of another order of force, greater and more authoritative, and a way out for the land of the rising sun. Perhaps paradoxically, the way out may be seen as supporting an old Japanese belief that mercilessness is the swiftest route to a merciful peace. Japanese hatred of her white enemies was certain to have swelled as their conventional bombs and shells destroyed the country. Were the atomic bombs humane in the long run by quickly ending the war and curbing that? Didn't the Vietnam War's years of peace negotiations take many more lives? All that is of course speculative, and nuclear weapons may yet become the scourge of humanity by fatally contaminating the planet, if not demolishing large parts of it. But until then, if and when that happens, Okinawa's caves, killing grounds and anguish should be remembered, together with the total of deaths there, which was greater than in Hiroshima and Nagasaki combined. The ambivalent human record suggests that the first atomic bombs probably prevented the homicidal equivalent of scores more of the same. The five to ten million Japanese deaths if invasion had been necessary, in addition to all the others, Western and Asian. It's difficult to comprehend such figures and to remember the strains of 1945. Focusing repulsion on the bomb is easier. But if a symbol is needed to help preserve the memory of the Pacific War, Okinawa is the more enduring one, 
General Stilwell, the new American commander, announced the campaign's official end on July 2, nine days after Okinawa had been declared secure. When a final surrender ceremony was held two months later, almost all the fighters were gone. The Marine divisions had been relieved by Army troops within days of the June 23 flag raising and shipped out, some savouring a fairly silly rumour that they were going home. In fact, most went to Guam for rehabilitation and retraining, as mentioned, then to occupation duty on the Japanese mainland and the Asian continent. Emperor Hirohito's surrender broadcast, nine days after the ruin of Hiroshima, flooded Guam with delectable new chatter. Home by Thanksgiving, by Christmas, by Easter, but not Dick Whittaker. In October, his regiment was shipped to China to help repatriate Japanese forces there. After the sweet revenge of watching officers humbly stack their swords, his battalion proceeded to other pleasures. Quartered in the port city of Tsingtao, it had the regiment's highest rate of venereal disease. Demobilised after eight months in China, Whitaker returned to Saugatai's on Memorial Day 1946 in time to watch Main Street's parade. He was still in uniform. There was little defiant trumpeting that the country was number one but much affection for our boys, Friends hugged him, his hand was pumped for hours. It was, he'd remember, a good day to come home. The spectators dispersed after the parade. His parents walked home, Dick to George Broom's saloon. George looked the same, and the bar stool felt the same. The first beer was on the house, the next was his. The war was over. The circle had closed. It had closed almost completely to those ignorant of battle, for the happy twenty-year-old who'd never written home about its real hardships found himself still unable to talk about them now. Combat veterans didn't know how to do that. They didn't want to brag to listeners who lacked the means to comprehend. What's the point? Gregarious Whitaker would ask in explanation of his near silence about his life's emotional apex and nadir. How can anyone know? Paul Fussell suggests another reason for the fighter's unspoken conspiracy of silence. They'd participated in an event that smeared a monstrous blot on the human race. The appalling outrages to decency so soon after those of World War I left them with a sense of shame for the species supposedly created in God's image. They were happy to forget them. Only other combat infantrymen knew, and none needed reminding, which is partly why veterans preferred swapping funny stories about the screw-ups to revisiting the horror. The funny thing is, they'd say one way and another, I remember more of the amusing incidents than the blood and the gore. Meeting others who did know would give them an infusion of battlefield camaraderie's unique intensity, as long as they lived, but their glow needed no extra stimulus then, in 1946. Although Whitaker was saddened to see many more gold stars on the yellowing honour roll over Broom's fireplace, some signifying the deaths of friends, his own name there generated deep satisfaction. After months of beers and laughter, the saloon doors stopped swinging with the newly demobilised. All who had made it through the war were home. Now the party too was over, but Whitaker remained proud. So did almost every American who returned from the edge without crippling injury. He had a lifelong reservoir of pride and self-confidence, even if outsiders would never know what filled it. Mark Jaffe, a first lieutenant who'd broken down with shock during his first fighting on an earlier island, but returned to win a bronze star for gallantry below the Shuri line, knew his life had been irrevocably changed. Whenever I ran into physical or psychological hardships later, I thought of Okinawa. I knew if I could survive that, I could survive anything. Jaffe and the others talked as little about the highs as the lows, but they'd never forget. Would they do it again, even with the excruciating fear and misery? You bet they would especially when asked while basking in their neighbours' grateful admiration and savouring the knowledge that they'd never have to do it again. That was the peak. My proudest moments. I can't explain it, but they were the best days of my life, when I was best. The battle is over, but Japan is still fighting. If we can decrease the enemy's power by even one or two men, that is our duty. A Japanese straggler on Okinawa said this. While the band that greeted Whitaker's troopship in San Diego banged cymbals in the hearts of her thousand passenger veterans, no music played on the wrecked Japanese piers, at which a trickle of Japanese ex-soldiers arrived from Okinawa in wretched defeat, 
Family members, themselves physically and spiritually traumatised by the ruinous war, welcomed their own with joyful pity, but many held the once vaunted army as a whole in scorn. The memory would remain hateful to most Japanese. In 1963, 18 years after the surrender, less than 1% of all surveyed by a television station remembered the war as the best period of their lives. The exceptions were presumably super patriots and ex-officers, now in the cold of Japan's powerful post-war anti-militarism. Moreover, most Okinawa veterans felt scarcely human at the time of their homecoming, which was still far off for a good number. The war that was over for Whitaker and his fellows dragged on for the 32nd Army's stragglers. For those thousands during the first months after the collapse of organised resistance, the American flag-raising and surrender ceremonies might as well have been on the moon. Even if the desperate fugitives had heard of the 10th Army's designation of the island as secure, it would have meant nothing to them. We shot three more Japanese last night, a Marine laconically recorded in his diary a week later. When the 32nd Army dissolved, few of its members were alive without some freakish act of providence, perhaps supplemented by their temperament. The surviving 10% probably had a higher-than-average quotient of initiative and individuality, qualities that would now count even more, as with the inhabitants of the last cave of medic Ikuo Ogiso, the actor turned de facto surgeon. More skeletons than soldiers, the macabre creatures had sunken eyes, uniforms stiff with mud and excrement, and no direction other than their own. When the cave was surrounded, the unit's chief medical officer ordered his 25 nurses' aides to exit and surrender. Calling themselves Yamato Nadeshiko, proud and virtuous Japanese women, those erstwhile students from a less prestigious high school than Ruriko Morishita's, pleaded for permission to remain and die with the soldiers or to join them on a breakout to the north. But the officer remained adamant and the girls obeyed. Ogiso would later write with relief that his commander, although a major in rank and a China veteran, saw his true mission as a medical doctor concerned with preserving life rather than a professional soldier who takes it. Thanks to him, twenty of the girls were eventually saved, twenty precious lives, mothers who now enjoy a peaceful life. The eighty-odd men who remained after the aides had left survived remorseless satchel charges and phosphorus bombs, but fear of death drove some to get it over with by running from the mouth. The others burrowed deeper into the vast cave, which was near the southern village of Itosu. In accordance with divisional headquarters' last order to continue fighting, passed down from General Ushijima's final message, Ogiso's chief instructed his men to form groups for sorties from the cave. The major then dissolved cyanide in the last of his alcohol and swallowed it, or was injected by an aide, as some near him believed. The cave was too dark for Ogiso to see. Leaving for their final attacks several nights after the Tenth Army's declaration of the end of organised resistance, the first groups felt as if a bad dream were animating their limbs. While the human bullets inched toward American positions until they were hit by conventional ones, six of the most respected and resourceful doctors and senior staff members remained in the cave. They had decided to wait until the enemy's guard went down and invited the conscientious Ogiso to join them. The modern cavemen devised ways of preserving fire in the eternal wet, the most precious commodity in the world for us. One of the best methods employed cartridge powder, empty cans and abandoned medical bandages woven into a slow-burning rope. Every flame was tended reverently, in fear of insanity without it. A supply of rotting rice gave the group several days of unhurried nostalgia and lice-picking between continued American explosions. Ogiso's cave was one of the prodigious southern ones that wove and twisted for mile after unexplored mile. Forced by American probes to move deeper into it, the gasping, tottering seven explored huge reaches of treacherous swampland, jagged mountain ranges, and secret passes unknown even by local Okinawans, a supernatural universe of eeriness and dread. Ogiso supposed the primal fear he felt in the perpetual darkness resembled that of human beings thousands of years earlier. The darkness and thick, sticky air coil around your skin while a weird aura rises from the grotesquely shaped stalactites and water's slimy surface. To live shut up in that darkness all alone was beyond a normal human being's endurance, 
the subterranean existence was fashioning a new order of human experience, combining elements of Robinson Crusoe, The War of the Worlds, and Dante's Inferno. Other Japanese encountered in the menacing vastness, for the bands remained almost totally apart, as if belonging to separate tribes, looked like a prehistoric subspecies. Accumulated spectacles of suffering in the gargantuan dungeon finally corroded Ogiso's training and self-discipline. A demented soldier's shriek of banzai to the emperor, as he flung himself to a watery death, filled the patriot with deep anger at the once revered deity. Emperor, do you really know? In your name, in places like this, men are dying unnatural, violent, miserable deaths. Yet the survivors sought to reassure themselves that they'd serve as guides for the forces who would soon arrive to liberate Okinawa. With ships like Yamato leading her superb navy, how could Japan lose? Months in the utterly sunless damp also bred physical affliction. To end the unbearable pain of a stomach disease, Ogiso armed a grenade and pulled the hissing metal to his chest. A doctor in the group kicked it away just in time. When the survivors finally emerged two months later, they joined a small army of stragglers who returned to underground refuges throughout the day, but spent nights careering through the countryside. Most began by trying to obey the order to penetrate to the mountainous north. One of the most persistent rumours was of units supposedly intact in a heavily forested area near the island's northern tip. Its name, Kunigami, was whispered as if it meant deliverance or secret superweapon. Shelling had so altered the landscape that finding their way would have been difficult in the darkness, even with a map. The North Star was the primary beacon to the mythical forest holdout, with its vividly pictured food, weapons and clean water. When band after band was slaughtered attempting to reach it by snaking through the American lines, some thought of swimming there with baskets of debris on their heads intended to blend with the battle's heavy flotsam in the water or floating to the mainland on rafts. American sentries on beaches leisurely picked them off, but the majority of stragglers simply existed, their goal reduced to staying alive until their rescue by the imagined Japanese counterlanding. The more principled groups agreed among themselves that individuals discovered by an enemy patrol or injured too seriously to carry on would unburden the others by killing themselves. But those who kept that promise delivered a fearful blow to their friends, of whom ever fewer were left. The still living roamed fields, smelling of the earth, whose fragrance they might be savouring for the last time, and of the decaying corpses they'd perhaps join before dawn, for they lived in constant dread of being shot at any second. Thank God American sentries speak loudly even on duty, one man noted fleeing their bullets, slithering back and forth, losing their way in villages whose every landmark had been destroyed. The human wrecks wormed from their caves and burrows every night to haunt southern Okinawa, inadvertently crunching rotting skeletons in the dark and passing cave entrances eerily glowing from the phosphorescent explosives tossed inside. They met, scattered, exchanged rumours, scavenged, and watched their numbers inexorably decline. The nightly activity lasted three or four hours, from when the Americans fell asleep in their tents to the first suggestion of dawn. Failure to return to a burrow or find a new one, even if it reeked with decomposing bodies, was a virtual death sentence. I wanted to grab the sun and smash it down. A straggler forced to endure the terror of several days above ground would remember. American leaflets proclaiming further resistance useless because Japan had capitulated were half-believed. Some wept reading reprints of the imperial edict of surrender. Others predicted that anyone who followed the American instructions for surrender, discard all arms, appear on specified beaches holding up a leaflet, would be tortured to death. Although the majority had lost all desire to keep fighting and used their remaining weapons only to save their lives, they lacked the will to free themselves from their new form of enslavement. Others, or the same men at different times, became determined to kill at least one of their monster hunters before the end. Chased into fields by American pacification units, some groups threw their last grenades at them and were filled with frustration when they didn't explode, or with satisfaction when they heard enemy screams. Others tossed grenades into audiences at outdoor movies or ambushed squads searching for them. The most daring crept into tents and massacred the sleepers, or more often stole food and weapons with growing expertise, 
sometimes even taking time to search for cigarettes. One team made off with a portable USO phonograph and records of the current American hit songs. Others interrupted their forays to enjoy moments of the open-air movies without trying to disrupt them. The victors lit grass fires to chase the desperados into walls of automatic fire. A straggler who returned alive from a pass covered by a machine gun reported seeing a red river of Japanese blood. When American dogs missed a man despite coming close enough for him to hear their panting, the trembling prey wondered whether it was because his months of bestial life had changed his smell from human to something else. Other terror-stricken groups sniffed the cigarette smoke of search patrols almost on top of them. The army's rigid class system and class consciousness collapsed. Similar aim and outlook were now what drew together the clusters that formed, and they were led by men of ability rather than rank. One straggler observed that unthinkingly obedient Japanese soldiers had become naked human beings who came together and dispersed by the force of human attraction and repulsion. Officers insulted to their faces by privates nevertheless begged them for admission into their groups. Exclusion or expulsion was a terrible fate, usually leading to starvation as well as the anguish of isolation, that state so achingly contrary to Japanese instinct. Some men joined groups headed for almost certain death at passes covered by machine guns, not out of non-existent hope, but for the last comfort of numbers. Friends promised each other to stay alive, but weaker ones gave up the exhausting work of hiding and allowed themselves to be killed. Other friends swore to each other never to separate under any circumstances, but of course did when bursts of enemy fire scattered them in terrified chaos or they simply lost touch in the dark. It was great credit to them that a semblance of civilised behaviour survived. The most seriously wounded men sometimes begged to be killed for the sake of the others. Some of those unable to join the forays for food would accept none, believing they had no right to it. But although acts of generosity and self-sacrifice were not uncommon among the newly made comrades, most bands regarded all others as rivals, sometimes quarrelling savagely over hiding places and tactics. While some members hated the gigantic Japanese military power that thrust us into this utter misery, with all the intensity remaining in their frail bodies, others threatened to kill anyone who mentioned surrender. Few of either stripe could keep themselves above the struggles over food. By September, an outsider who stole a morsel from a group's supply risked instant death. One ring cautiously dug up a portable safe their unit commander had buried before killing himself. They were ecstatic to find bundles of thousands of 100 yen bills stacked inside, because the paper on which the fortune was printed was enough to cook a canteen of rice. Some groups fought others like bandit gangs for a cache of anything edible, sometimes with swords and to the death. Food included wormy sweet potatoes and worms themselves. Arriving at New Kays, starving survivors rummaged feverishly among decomposing corpses. The rucksacks still on the backs of the bodies were putrid with rotting flesh, but the men managed to swallow hardtack that had dried rock-like after its soaking in blood. Perhaps the unluckiest Japanese of all were those who suspected the truth about the end of the war, but feared retaliation by others, mostly non-commissioned officers, who were convinced their duty was to stay ready to join the Japanese counter-landing. Whatever the 32nd Army had suffered before, the surviving stragglers endured more, and by this time for longer than the campaign itself. Thomas Hanaher said, In the later stages of the campaign, I was assigned to guard a large compound of prisoners. The inmates were behind barbed wire. Most were civilians, but it was hard to tell. One of them blew himself up with a hand grenade. By early 1946, the several hundred Okinawan soldiers who remained loyal to the Imperial Army lived in the same predicament as the fair percentage of Japanese survivors who wanted to surrender but didn't know how. Although some used the same caves for rest stops, the two nationalities usually remained separate and less engaged in barter. Shinichi Kuniyoshi, the native boy who repeatedly defied death to deliver the message to Yozadaka, shared the life of desperate fleeing and hiding. Now 15 years old, he was approaching collapse from exhaustion and the pain of maggots eating his flesh at every cut and scratch. As much as he was able to think at all, Shinichi realised he wanted to continue living, but he had no idea how to give himself up. Masahid Ota was slightly more committed, 
After his failure to escape by swimming and inexplicable washing ashore, he made his way inland to pursue the instinct for survival, but with no real hope of ending alive. A good half of the normal school's 400 students would survive, but only about a quarter of his class of 128. The starving 20-year-old ran into a fiercely patriotic Japanese second lieutenant, formerly assigned to guard duty at the 32nd Army's Shuri Castle headquarters, and now furious at the traitorous Okinawans whose betrayal had cost Japan the battle. Declaring that locals had no right to be in that sensitive area, he prepared to protect Japanese interests and vent his revenge by shooting the trespasser. Ota saved himself by thinking quickly enough to produce an old document certifying his assignment to intelligence operations. The tattered scrap in his pocket was miraculously still readable after his time in the sea and crawling in the fields.